Hi, I'm Eric Siegel with Eric'sTrains.com and welcome to episode 46 of my video train blog series. Okay, it's mid-May 2014 and over the last few episodes I've been showing you the progress on this area of the layout. There's a lot of work that's been going on here. I replaced the old Atlas turntable with the new Millhouse River Studio turntable that you see there. And I've also installed the final section of the big steel bridge that goes across the main room, thereby completing the upper level of track. So I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about the progress I've made, and then I'm going to give you a demonstration of how I install the whisker tracks around the new turntable, and how I program those whisker tracks into the turntable's indexing system. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so here's a look at all the work I've been doing in this area of the layout lately. I'm going to start by talking about the bridge, and then we'll go into the turntable. And then from there, I'll segue into the demonstration of the programming of the turntable and setting up one of the whisker tracks. But as you can see, the third and final section of the big steel bridge that comes across the main table is in place and the bridge is functionally complete. It is operational. I have run a couple test trains across it, so it does work. Now, I still have some aesthetic work left to do on it. As you can see, I'm still working on the deck up here. I'm working on the walkways right now, and then once those are done, I'll put the handrails in place, and then the deck will be finished. And then I also may add a couple more support towers on the underside of this third section. That's why there's no scenery right here, because I may put another tower right here, like that. And this is the tower that will go right there. Now this tower isn't finished yet. It's structurally finished, but it's not painted yet. Once I paint it and weather it, it'll look like that tower right there. Now, functionally speaking, it doesn't need any more towers underneath it. If I add any more support towers, it'll just be for aesthetic reasons and nothing more. But anyway, there's the entire steel bridge finally complete. If I walk you down it, we'll start over here. And it comes down this way, wraps around there, and then back around this way, and then finishes up over here. It's about 18 or 19 feet long. I bought it in three sections. The first section here was about eight feet long. That was the biggest section. And then the second section starts right here and goes right until about midway between those two support towers. That was about five or six feet long. And then the final section here is about five feet long. Now, this was a custom-built steel bridge that was made for me by Jim Ballman at Stainless Unlimited. And what he did is he made the raw steel bridge for me. And then when I got it, I painted it and I weathered it with salt weathering. And then I'm adding the deck on top myself. So it's just a beautiful custom-made steel bridge, and it's, it's real stainless steel. I mean, you could stand on this thing if you wanted to. It's very strong, very sturdy. It's not plastic or wood or anything like that. It's real stainless steel. Now, some people have asked me why this steel bridge curves the way it does. Why doesn't it go straight across the layout? Because that would be more direct and more prototypical, especially since you don't see a whole lot of curved steel girder bridges in the world today. There are some, but you don't see a whole lot of them. Well, the reason I made it curve, there were actually two reasons that I made it curve like the way it does. The first reason was that, and really the most important reason, was that I didn't want the bridge to be boring. I thought that if it went straight across the table, it would be boring and wouldn't be very interesting because I've got three straightaways down here, there are three more straightaways on the back side, and there's another straightaway on the upper level back there on the spine. So I thought that adding one more straightaway would just make an incredibly boring bridge, and I didn't want to have that. I wanted it to have some interesting features to it and have a little more of a dynamic look to it, and that's what it has now because it starts off, you know, a little bit recessed into the layout and comes out in front in front of the visitors so they can really see the train coming across the bridge. Then it dips back and you get some depth to the layout. Goes all the way back there and then comes up again to meet up at the other side. And I think that's just a lot more interesting than having a straight bridge. It may not be prototypically correct, but it's a subjective decision that I made 
in order to help the layout look better overall. You know, a layout is a lot like a movie. It's all about selling the illusion and sort of suspension of disbelief. And as long as you can sell the illusion and make it look like it could be real, people will be happy with it and they'll like it and they'll find it interesting. And that's what I tried to do with this bridge. Yeah, it may not be prototypical, but it looks interesting. The weathering makes it look realistic. And so in reality, you know, I've had a few people ask why the bridge curves, but most people have never even mentioned it because it just looks so interesting. It doesn't even cross their mind. So I'm really happy with the progress that I've made on this bridge. I'm really happy that it's finally finished and functional. It's a really big deal because I've been planning on this bridge since I started the layout seven years ago. I've been actively working on it for about three years. So it's been a long time coming. It was a Herculean task. You know, when I first started it, I was really dreading it because I thought, geez, this is going to be so much work, but it was worth the wait, I think. And all in all, I'm just thrilled that it's finally complete and that it looks so good. It looks better than I ever thought it would. And, you know, it's one of the, I've talked about this before, but it's one of the rewards that you get from doing work on a layout is that sometimes you're able to step back and sort of detach yourself from the work and say, hey, you know, I think this looks pretty good. I can't believe that I did this. And that's what I think of when I look at this bridge. I look at it and I think, you know, I'm not very skilled. I'm not an expert at model railroading and building layouts. And yet I think this looks really, really good. And so I'm extremely happy with the result. And I'm even happier that finally the upper level of track is functional. And at the next open house this November, I'll be able to run trains full time on the upper level. Hey, look at that. Between camera takes, I finished the walkways on this final section. And so now the only thing to do is to add the handrails and then we'll be in business. And that's sort of a sample of how fast this work is moving along. I'm really excited to be working on this area of the layout right now. I've been doing a lot of work every day and so for that reason it's been moving along at a really brisk pace. And in fact, that's why I haven't shot very many videos in the last week or two because I've just been busy working on the layout. And in order to shoot a video I have to stop what I'm doing and shoot the video and I just haven't felt like stopping because I'm so eager to get this area of the layout finished. But anyway, I'm not going to run any trains across the bridge today because I'm going to do a separate video of that in just a few days. As soon as I finish the deck here, I will do a video with the maiden voyage of a train over the completed bridge and I'll run several trains over the bridge in that video. So keep an eye out for that. I'll do it as soon as I finish the deck. So that'll probably be in three, four, maybe five days. Now let's talk about the turntable. As you can see, I've done a lot more work since the last episode. I've ballasted almost all of the whisker tracks around the turntable. There's just a handful of unfinished tracks right over here. And in fact, we're going to finish one of those whisker tracks during this video. Now, as for the turntable itself, just like last time, the deck of the turntable is still unfinished. I have not installed all of the detail parts. And like I said before, that's because that will be the last thing I do after all of this other work is done because I don't want to risk breaking any of the nice detail parts while I'm doing the other work around the turntable. So what I want to do now is give you an overview of how the indexing system on the Millhouse River Studio turntable functions and then I'll show you how I install one of the whisker tracks and how I program the whisker tracks into the turntable's indexing system. Now, when you buy the Millhouse River Studio turntable, you can buy it with or without the indexing system. The indexing system does cost extra. If you don't get the indexing system, you have to line the turntable up by sight every time you take it to a whisker track. I didn't want to bother with that. I wanted to automate all the stops, so that's why I got the indexing system. But of course, you can do whatever you want. But keep in mind that this demonstration is going to be from the point of view of someone who is using the indexing system. And also, I want to point out that I don't want you to think of this demonstration as a substitute for reading the directions that come with the turntable. If you buy one of these things, make sure you read all of the directions. They're very well written, and they will explain how to use every feature of the turntable. Okay, so the indexing system consists of this control pad and then 
this cable goes to a control board that's mounted to the underside of the turntable. And what the indexing system does is that it takes the circle of the turntable and divides it up into 8,191 positions. And so on a 24 inch turntable like this, what that means is that the distance between each position on the turntable is less than 1 16th of an inch. So that gives you very precise control in terms of where the turntable stops. And so installing a whisker track is very easy. All you have to do is line the whisker track up with one of those 8,191 positions. It's very easy. I'm going to use my good old yardstick to illustrate what I'm talking about. So I said the circle is divided up into 8,191 positions. On my turntable, position 0, or to be more precise, position 0000, because the position numbers are four digits, is right about here. And then it goes counterclockwise, one, two, three, four, five, six, all the way around until we get to position 8,191, which is just to the right of position 0000, where we started. So installing a whisker track is just a matter of lining the whisker track up with a specific position number on the turntable. So let me show you a specific example. This is whisker track number 13 on my turntable. I've got 19 tracks coming into the turntable. This is number 13. Why is it number 13? Well, that's the shortcut ID that I gave it. We'll get to that in a few minutes, but they're all numbered 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, all the way down. And this is number 13. So if I look at the notes that I've made about my turntable positions, I've got all my shortcut numbers here, 00 through 18. I'll get back to those in a few minutes and explain them. But if we look at number 13, to the right of it, you can see the numerical position ID that corresponds to whisker track number 13, which is 5,419. So on the circle of 8,191 positions, whisker track number 13 is at 5,419. So... If I pull up the control pad here, I can call up that specific position number. Now this is in the instructions, so don't worry if it doesn't make much sense, but to call up a specific position number, I press the second button, five, and then the position number, which is 5,419, and then I hit enter, and lo and behold, the turntable is moving to position 5,419, which just so happens to line up with my 13th whisker track. There it goes, and it'll slow down and settle right into position 13, bam, like that. And that's all there is to it. So let's try it for whisker track number 11. If I look at my notes, I can see that 11 is at 6,035. So I'll go to my keypad and hit second five six zero three five enter and it's moving to position six thousand thirty five which lines it right up with whisker track number eleven pretty cool now at this point you may be saying hey eric how did you know that whisker track number eleven was at position six thousand thirty five well it's just trial and error I punched various position numbers into the turntable until I zeroed in on the exact number that lined the track on the turntable up with the whisker track perfectly, and that just happened to be position 6035. 6036 was a little bit too far to one side, 6037 was a little bit too far to the other side, 6036 was right on the money, and that's why track number 11 is at position 6036. Now, knowing the numerical position of each of your whisker tracks is all good, but after a while, it would get to be kind of a pain in the butt to have to press all of those buttons on the keypad just to go to one of your whisker tracks. So that's where these shortcut numbers come into play. Think of these as bookmarks for the indexing system. There are 51 slots available, 00 through 50. I've got 19 tracks on my turntable, so I'm using slots 00, through 18. And as you can see, slot number 11 is assigned to position 6035. But let's say that it wasn't and I wanted to program it into the system. Well, 
All I would have to do is first make sure the turntable is at the correct position that I want, which it is, 6,035. And now I'll come over to the keypad and I'll hit clear just to clear out anything that might be in the system. And then I'll hit second and one. That takes us into program mode. And now I'll hit the shortcut ID, 11, hit enter, the light flashes, and now position 6035 is assigned to shortcut number 11. So let's see it in action. Here's track number 13, which I've already programmed previously. So if I want to go to it, on the keypad, I press the shortcut number 13 and hit the up arrow. And just like that, it goes over to track number 13, which is at position 5,419. Now, if I want to go back to track 11, we've already programmed it in, so I'll hit 11 and then the up arrow. And look at that. It's going to track number 11. It's really cool. And one more time, let's go to track 12 here in the middle, which I've already programmed. So track 12, up arrow. And there it is. Now, there's also a down arrow on the keypad. What is that for? Well, on the turntable, there are two ends. There's the cab end and the non-cab end. I don't have the cab installed yet, but the cab end is the one with that LED wire dangling out of it that is facing track 12 right now. But what if I wanted to turn it around so the other end of the turntable came to track 12? That's what the down arrow is for. So, if I came over here to the keypad and I hit 12 down, not up, now watch what happens. It's going to go on quite a trip because it's doing a complete 180 and it's going to bring the back side of the turntable around to track number 12. And that is really cool because it means that when you've got an engine on the turntable, you can slide it into one of your whisker tracks any way you want because you can make the turntable, either end of the turntable, go to a position. And here it goes sliding into position 12 from the opposite end. Pretty cool. If I do the same thing for number 13. Now it brings the non-cab end over to track number 13. And now let's bring the cab end around again. Let's go to track number 11, cab end, up arrow. And again, it's gonna go on quite a trip because it's coming all the way around. Love that speed control. This thing has such great speed control on it. And here it is. The cab end now coming around to track 11. So as you can see, this turntable is incredibly versatile. Very cool. Okay, now if all of that didn't make sense to you, don't worry, because we're about to dive in and do all of that from scratch. I'm in the process of setting up whisker track number 15 over here that's just to the left of that single support tower. I had whisker track 15 set up previously, but I had to move it over by about an inch or so to make room for that support tower, so I've got to set it up again. So I'm going to walk you through how I set up one of these whisker tracks, how I get it installed and get it nice and level so that it's a nice smooth transition between the turntable deck and the whisker track. And then finally, we'll program whisker track number 15 into the system. Okay, so here we have whisker track number 15, or what will be whisker track 15 when we're done. I'm using Atlas Track, and I've got the track sitting on a roadbed product called Flexbed that I've talked about many times before. Flexbed is a product that's made by a company called Hobby Innovations. This is what it looks like. It's a vinyl roadbed. I'm using the quarter-inch O-scale Flexbed. I love this stuff. One of the many great characteristics about it is that it's springy. It compresses and comes back to where it was, and that makes it very handy for what we're about to do. And I'll explain why in a few minutes, but this is great stuff, and I highly recommend it. Now, I've got screws going through the track already, through the flex bed and into the table. They're not tight, however, because I want the track to have a little give so that we can make any fine adjustments that are necessary to get the track perfectly lined up with the track on the turntable. 
Now, when I first started building my layout, I used to glue the flex bed to the table, but nowadays I don't do that. I just put the flex bed down and put the screws through the track and let the screws hold the flex bed down. That's just easier and faster, and also if I ever need to take up the track, the flex bed will come up very easily since it's not glued down. Now, as I said, I'm using Atlas Track, but you don't have to if you don't want to. You could use Ross or Gargraves or even MTH Scale Tracks. You could probably make this work with Lionel Fast Track if you wanted to, although it would be a little odd because Lionel Fast Track is not very realistic looking and the turntable is very prototypical looking, so you'd have a bit of a clash there, but I guess you could make it work if you really wanted to. The track on the turntable bridge itself is Atlas, so I'm using Atlas here. There's Atlas on the turntable, so it's gonna be a perfect match for me. When it comes to providing power to the whisker tracks, Atlas makes that very easy because they make these terminal joiner clips that you can buy, and they have wires attached to them, and so the wires run under the table and to the power supply. So we have hot on the center rail and ground on this outer rail. However, I have found that when it comes to whisker tracks, because a whisker track sits all by itself on the layout, it's best to provide ground to both outer rails and not just one. Because experience has shown me that if you have ground on only one of the outer rails, you will sometimes get erratic operation out of your engines because if there's even just a little bit of dust on the tracks, all of a sudden you're relying on only one rail for ground and the engine can cut out on you. So if you look on the ends of all my whisker tracks, I've got a wire soldered that bridges the two outer rails so that now we have hot on the center rail and ground on both outer rails. And with that configuration, you get much more consistent operation out of your whisker tracks. And this doesn't apply just to Atlas track. It applies to any brand of track. I would recommend bridging the outer rails on any brand of track that you're gonna use for your whisker tracks. Moving on, we're over here where the whisker track meets up with the turntable. And if you look, you'll see that I've driven two track screws through the track right here where it meets the turntable. These two screws are critical because these will allow us to make the precision adjustments that are necessary to get the whisker track perfectly lined up with the track on the turntable. And as I said before, they're in there very loosely right now so that we still have some play on the whisker track to make any adjustments that we need. So anyway, what we're gonna do now is bring the turntable over and use a little bit of trial and error to get the track on the turntable lined up with the whisker track. All right, so because I've already installed a bunch of other whisker tracks around this turntable, I've got a pretty good idea of what neighborhood we're in right now in terms of position number. I know that whisker track 14 over here is around position 5000, and it goes up that way and down this way, so we're most likely between positions 4000 and 5000. So let's take a guess, and we'll choose position 4200. So on the keypad, I'll hit second, five, four, two, zero, zero. Hit enter, and let's see where it goes. Okay, not bad. It's really not bad for this track that I'm going to install next. But for this track, let's move up a little bit. Let's try 4500. So second five, 4500. Okay, now we're getting close. Okay, let's try position 4600. Looks like we overshot it just a little bit. Let's back it off and try 4575. We're getting really close. Let's bump it to the right just a little bit and try 4580. Okay, we are really close. I'm gonna bump it over just a hair. Let's try 4583. There we go, perfect. It's nice and lined up, that's the way we want it, and that's the way it's done. So in my notes for my turntable, I will now put down that whisker track 15 
is at position 4583. Okay, in this overhead shot, you can see what the joint between the turntable track and the whisker track looks like. What you want to shoot for is about a sixteenth of an inch gap between these outer rails and the rails on the turntable. The center rail will be a little bit closer, that's the way it is with this Atlas track, but for these outer rails, I like about a sixteenth of an inch. You want to resist the temptation to push the tracks as close together as possible, because if you do that, when the turntable starts rotating, this outer rail will scrape up against this center rail. It'll spark and create a short, and that'll end your fun. So you want to have, I like to have, about a sixteenth of an inch gap. It won't affect the performance of the engines at all, and it'll avoid problems with the rails hitting each other as the turntable moves. And you also want to make sure that the gap between these two rails is the same as the gap between these two rails. If these are even, that means your track is hitting the turntable straight on and is not at any sort of a cockeyed angle. Okay, so the next step in the installation of the whisker track is a critical one. We want to make sure that we've got a smooth transition between the track on the turntable and the track on the whisker. And I'm talking about rail height. We want to make sure the height of the rails on the whisker track is equal to the height of the rails on the turntable. And really, the best tool you can use to determine whether you've got a smooth transition is your fingertips. If you run your fingertips along the transition, you can tell if there's a change in the rail height. And doing it right now, I can tell that for all three rails on the whisker track, the rails are below the level of the turntable. Well, we really can't do much about the height of the rails on the turntable, but we can change the height of the rails on the whisker track. So in this case, we need to raise them up so that they're at the same level as the track on the turntable. Now, this is where the springiness and the compressibility of the flex bed road bed material comes into play. If we had a situation where the rails on the whisker track were higher than the rails on the turntable, all we'd have to do would be to tighten these screws, which would compress the flex bed material, thereby lowering the track and lowering the height of the rails, and we would just tighten the screws slowly until we had a nice smooth transition. But as it turns out, the rails on the whisker track are actually lower than the rails on the turntable, so we need to raise them up. But we're still going to use the compressibility of the flex bed in our favor. What we're going to do is actually raise the level of the rails on the whisker track a little bit higher than the rails on the turntable, and then we'll still use these screws to compress it down and get it at just the right height so we've got a perfect transition. So to raise the height of the whisker track, we're going to use some plastic shims. These are just some pieces of styrene plastic that I cut out of a sheet of styrene plastic that I bought at a local hobby shop, so they're nothing fancy. I'm going to use two shims in this case, so what I'll do is take my screwdriver and loosen these screws so that there's room to slide the shims under the whisker track up here. And then I'll take my shims and I will slide them right up here under the front of the whisker track, like that. And now I've got a situation where the whisker track is actually higher than the track on the turntable. That's what we want. Now we're going to use the compressibility of the flex bed, tighten these screws, and bring that track down, bring those rails down, until we get a perfect transition. So get it lined up and use my fingers to feel for the transition. This side's pretty good. This side needs to come down just a little bit, so I'll tighten it. Pretty good. Let's tighten it a little bit more. It's pretty good. This side needs to come up now a little bit, so I'll loosen it a little bit. All right. Make sure it's lined up, that we haven't gotten out of alignment. And there we go. Now we've got a nice smooth transition between the rails on the turntable and the rails on the whisker track. And that's how it's done and that's where the compressibility of this flex bed material comes in really handy. If this was cork road bed, it would be a little bit more work because if it was too high, we'd have to shave the cork road bed. And if it was too low, we'd have to try to get just the right number of shims under there to get it at just the right height. But with this compressibility, 
you have a lot of play and so all I do is boost it up so that it's higher and then use these screws to bring it back down so it's perfect. Okay, believe it or not, we're actually pretty close to being done here. The next thing I like to do is to take my level and run it down the whisker track and make sure everything's on the bubble or as close as possible. It doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. And I'll also stick it this way just to make sure my track is nice and straight and there aren't any bad dips. And when it comes to the track down here by the transition, sometimes it'll be a little off the bubble, but that's okay because having a smooth transition here is more important than it being perfectly level. And that's pretty good the way it is, so I'm going to leave it like that. And all in all, it looks pretty good. Now, you may come across a situation like this where the track is not quite as level as you would like. And in this situation, we're going to do exactly what we did up front at the transition. We will use either some plastic shims or we'll tighten some screws to help level the track out. And again, we're going to use the compressibility of the flex bed road bed to our advantage. So in this case, the track is dipping to the left a little bit. So I'll just tighten this track screw on the right. And that'll push that side down a little bit. And now we're all good. Okay, once you've got your track nice and level and you've made sure the track is also straight, the last thing we're going to do before we ballast the track is to run an engine over it to test for functionality and to test the transition up here. We want to take special note of the smoothness of the transition. We want to watch for any hopping or skipping. And if we see any, we'll make some adjustments up here to get that transition as smooth as possible. Okay, I've got a switcher on the turntable, so let's go ahead and roll it onto the whisker track and see how it does. Now, this is a small whisker track. It's not big enough for anything like an SD70 or an ES44, although I could probably just fit one on here. But these three whisker tracks on this side are mainly for small engines like switchers. So let's go ahead and pull it on. Looks pretty good. And we'll try it the other way. Now that I've tested out the whisker track and everything checks out, the last thing I'm going to do is lay down some ballast on the whisker track to make everything look nice. I like to use Brennan's Better Ballast. This is made by my friend Dennis Brennan. You can pick it up at his website at www.brennansmodelrr.com. I think this is the best ballast on the market. It's real crushed granite ballast. It doesn't get any more realistic than this, but you can use whatever you want. Okay, I gave the glue on the ballast about a day or so to dry, so the ballast is complete, and I added a little Atlas track bumper down here. And while I was at it, I also completed whisker track number 16. Now, I do want to point something out. If you look at the sides of the rails, you'll see some discoloration. That's because I weather my track, and I paint the sides of the rails to make them look more realistic. And you'll see here that there's some brown here, and then you've got nice shiny rails here. That's because when I redid the whole turntable area, I used a combination of some old recycled track and some new track that I bought. So that's why you've got new track here and then old weathered track here. That will go away eventually because I will get out my paintbrush and 
repaint the sides of the rails and make it all look nice. So don't worry about that. So the last thing we want to do before we give this thing a full trial run, and it's something that I almost forgot, is we want to program our new whisker track into the indexing system. So let's pull the engine around to our new whisker track, which as you remember is at position 4583. So I'll hit second, five, four, five, eight, three. And here she comes. Okay, and with the turntable now in the proper position, we're gonna program it into slot 15. So I'll hit second, one, now we're in program mode, 15, enter, the light blinked, so the programming was successful. So Whisker Track 15 has now been programmed into the indexing system. So now let's give this thing a full trial run. We will pull the switcher into the yard, pull it onto the turntable, and rotate it around and park it on our new whisker track. Okay, so there you have it. I hope you enjoyed the little how-to on the turntable. And if you like what you've seen, it gets even better because Millhouse River Studio just came out with a brand new TMCC module for the turntable and they have sent me that module. So in an upcoming video, I will demonstrate how to run the turntable using the Lionel Legacy Remote instead of the keypad that I'm using right now. So that will be really cool. Keep an eye out for that video in the near future. Anyway, I've only got one whisker track left to finish on the turntable, so once that's done, I will likely begin working on the detail parts of the turntable bridge. So this area of the layout is really starting to come back into shape, and I'm really happy with the progress that I've made on the turntable and the big steel bridge. And speaking of the big steel bridge, again, I will be putting out a video very soon. It will probably be the next video that I put out and it will be a ribbon cutting ceremony for the now completed bridge. So that should be a lot of fun. Keep an eye out for that in the near future. But for now, that's it. I'm Eric Siegel, and I'll see you next time.